The beautiful and heavenly sound of the flute that you're hearing is none other than the world-renowned British flute soloist and recording artist William Bennett. More affectionately known to his friends, colleagues and fans by his nickname, Wib. The ongoing demand for Bennett as teacher and performer keeps him on the road, appearing at conventions, masterclasses and recitals all over the world. During his recent American tour, he made time to visit my home in Deland, Florida, where he performed a recital and afterwards I was thrilled to be able to sit down with Wib for an informal chat. There was so much to talk about. This very special webisode of Adventures in Music is brought to you by Windsor Press, publishers of the best biographical publications for the next generation of flutists and educators. Musician biographies, educational texts, sheet music and CDs are now shipping worldwide. Shop online at windsorpress.com where you can learn from the masters. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be with you and to have spent the last few days with you while you did your recital and the master class yesterday, which I believe was a tremendous success. I know you worked very hard. I'm going to go back in years and actually the first thing I'm going to ask you is because you've always been called Wib by everybody who really knows you and I want you to tell me what those initials stand for. Well, I often tell them, William Ignoramus Bastardus Bennett. It is, in fact, my initials for a slightly different name. <laughs> right. <laughs> Would you like to tell me what the real Wib stands for? William Ingham Brooke Bennett. Well, do you know, I've known you probably for about 60 years, and I never knew that More. until yesterday. Now, we have to tell people that you studied the flute with my father, which is why we go back so far together. Yes. Um, what age were you when you actually did that first audition for him? I played to him first. Um, I was about 15 and three quarters. I thought that was As about a school the boy, age. Yes. yes. And do you remember what you played for him? Of course, the Mozart I... D major flute concerto. Yes. <laughs> did you know that he shot out of the music room and shot all the way up to where mummy was sitting and said, Come back and listen outside the door. This one is going to be a world beater. Did you know that? I didn't know that until you told me many, many years later about that. <laughs> right. Well, he only did it with one person, and that was you. Yeah. So you were very special even at that age. It must have been stunning playing. But tell me, how did you get to that standard? When did you begin? Why did you pick the flute? Um, how did you get to that standard by 15? Well, um, I was at school, boarding school, during the war, from age of seven, shunted away to Wiltshire. When I was about eight, one of the boys in the school came back from the local town, having bought a sort of plastic whistle, might, might call it a recorder. Um, and this was marvellous. I thought, I must have one of those. So I drew out all the rest of the term's pocket money from the housemaster and got on my bicycle and charged down and got myself my first whatever it was, call it a recorder. It was not as good as a recorder even. I progressed on this rather fast. It had a few f a fingering chart on the back for the notes and some tunes written down in a very strange sort of notation. And by the first evening, I was mastering the tune Clementine. And I can remember the matron coming around and saying, it's time that little girls went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> now that wasn't Dartington Hall, was it? No, that was a school called Beltane. That was before Dartington, presumably. I never went to Dartington. You didn't? No, I, my school was this Beltane, which is an old English word for hellfire. How w old were you when you left there? Well, I was 16, short, oh. shortly after I'd started having flute lessons. Tell me a little bit about your parents, because they weren't musicians, were they? What no. Did, what did no. they do? 
My parents were both architects. Um, my mother had studied architecture a, a little bit and also studied drawing and things in Paris. My father was an architect and that was his profession, but he'd also studied drawing. And he'd also been a choir boy in Brighton Cathedral when he was young, so there was a little bit of music there. Otherwise, the only connection with music was the wind-up gramophone, which had a few records left over from very early in the war. When I was three years old, we had this gramophone, and I succeeded in breaking an awful lot of the records. <laughs> and there were a few left in 1943 when we got the gramophone back, I think. And I started playing them again, but a lot of them had great big bites out of them. Well, now, you also draw very beautifully and very colourfully and fun drawings, mm -hmm. don't you? Have you? You've always done that, presumably. That's just a natural part well, of you. Well, yes, people... My, my parents ha had a circle of artists around them. You know, they were part of some sort of Chelsea set or Bloomsbury set, I think they were out of. Lots of painters and poets and all that. And there was always a pen. My father was often drawing things. And I just always used to like drawing. I, one of the favorite things to do at a school was the time when we did painting or anything like that. So that was second nature to me. But it's wonderful to have the talent of music and being able to draw um, as well. Now, we might mention at this point that you have a, um, a book that has come out, which is called A Flute for Life, mm -hmm. and it's all about your, your story with the flute, but it's also got lots of your drawings in. So if people wanted to actually see the fun things that you do, for example, the fingerprint drawings, which are my particular favourite when you take a, a sort of thumbprint and, and, and make faces and people and animals and things playing the flute. And, yeah. um, I, I think that's uh, most original. And you have some of those in the book. Do I? I can't remember. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did a Christmas cards and things with thumbprints for heads and put faces on them, yes. Yes, you did. And in the archive that I was telling you about, Daddy's archive, um, your section, I have those same cards, and we saved oh, them. They saved them um, all those years, and I have all the Christmas cards that you sent us with My the drawings goodness. on. Isn't that lovely? Oh, yes. It's really lovely. Wib, A Flute for Life, is a comprehensive biographical text about the life and legacy of the incredible William Bennett. Author Edward Blakeman writes, This is not a traditional biography. Rather, it is an invitation to spend time with an extraordinary mercurial personality. You will be able, for the first time, to follow Wibb in detail through his extraordinary life devoted to the flute. Featuring over 100 personal photos and hand-drawn sketches by Wibb himself, Wibb, A Flute for Life, is available now on windsorpress.com. Let's get back to the flute. You then, you had to go in the army for two years, didn't you? Didn't you do national yes, service? Yes, that was a, a little later, yes. But right. first, first uh, I, I announced to my parents when I was 15, I want to be a flute player. Oh, and they right. were aghast. If I'd said I want to be a poet or a painter or something, they would have been much less alarmed. They thought I'd end up playing the flute in Lion's Corner House, which is a place <laughs> right. where people played while other people slurped their soup. <laughs> um, but they were very alarmed by this. And then they sought advice from various people they knew, and your father was found. And he, I'd heard my father, my father quizzed me, well, who are the best flute players in the country? Um, and I knew three names, the three people who played on the radio all the time. The first was Geoffrey Gilbert, who I'd heard on the radio when I was at school, perhaps a year before, playing a Mozart concerto from the proms. The inauguration of his famous platinum flute. Um, 
And I was absolutely knocked out with this wonderful, wonderful sound which he made. And so he was the hot favorite. But anyway, in answer to my father's questions, there was Jeffrey Gilbert, there was Gareth Morris and John Francis. And then my father conferred with a friend of his who was the principal of the Guildhall School of Music. And at the Guildhall School of Music, Geoffrey Gilbert was one of the teachers and so was John Francis. And uh, this chap called Edric Cundall said, oh yes, I think Geoffrey Gilbert's your man. <laughs> and so we, I went and played to him and happily he took me on. And I'm so happy I didn't get anybody else. I got the best teacher in the world. He was a genius. <laughs> yes, he was. How long did you study with him? With well, I wasn't quite sure. I did two and a half years or something. I, I, I was with him for a few months before I actually entered the Guildhall, age 16. And then I did two more years until I had to join the army. And then I went on having lessons after that. And then I went to Paris and I had some more lessons after that. And then I, I think he got me into my first job and I went on having lessons when that was going on. And it turned out, somebody found out who came to do an article about Geoffrey, that I'd been having lessons over 10 years with him. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, you must have learned an awful lot about the flute in that time, I would imagine. Well, I, I was picking up things left, right, left and centre anyway, but yes. <laughs> right. Now, do you remember coming back to the Guildhall? Because you played in the Guildhall Orchestra when I was there. By that time, I, I went to the Guildhall at 15. So I was probably, by that time, maybe 17, 18, something like that. And you came back and played in the orchestra because um, I think we did that. Did we do Daphnis and Chloe when you were there? No? Don't remember doing that. Well, you did the Mozart. I think you played I, the I Mozart. Played some, I played the Ebert Concerto oh, with the Guildhall Ebert. Orchestra. Ebert, okay. Because um, I was in the orchestra at that time, and yeah. of course, you know, um, just very much admiring your your talent and your, the skill that you had. Yeah. Now, what was the first orchestral job that you did? Well, um, freelance jobs were playing little gigs on television and things like that. And then one day, which must have been after I was in the army, your mum rang up and said, are you free to go to Manchester tomorrow and do an audition for the BBC Northern Orchestra? And I think that they suddenly needed a replacement first flute. And Geoffrey had said he might do. So I went up the next day on the train and did an audition for them on a, about a Wednesday or something in the week. And they said, OK, when I'd played all of orchestral excerpts, which he taught me. Um, they said, OK, you're starting on Monday. Oh so my I did. <laughs> that was um, quick. That was just after I'd studied in Paris, actually. Right. And so I was 21 or 22 when I started that. Right. I didn't realise you'd played with the Northern Orchestra, but just going back to Paris for a moment, um, you studied with Moise? No, no, no. no. Moise was great hero from the gramophone records. Oh, right. What about Rampal? Rampal was another one we knew very well. Right. Uh, by records. He wasn't my absolute hero, but he was pretty good. Um, and when I was in Paris, I was slightly dissatisfied with the teaching I was getting. And Geoffrey came to Paris with the RPO, I think. And he came and heard a flute lesson. And I, I, I did my thing and played to Karache and he, he demonstrated the lesson too. And then we came out, went to a cafe and Geoffrey said, I, I don't think that man is doing the, making the right sort of sound. You might learn an awful lot more if you went and studied from Rampal. I had a friend in Paris, a, a, a girl who played the flute and the harp was studying with um, Rampal and Lily Laskin, and so she had the top of the tree on both instruments. Oh my goodness. And she had often been saying, 
an American girl called Dorothy White. Um, and she kept on saying, why don't you learn from Rampal? <laughs> and when Jeffrey said you might learn something, uh, I more or less <laughs> rang Dorothy at once and said, can you fix it up? And a few days later, I was playing from Rampal. It was towards the end of my time in Paris. I had about four months in Paris in all. And um, the last month I had these few lessons from Jean-Pierre, who taught me an, a wonderful amount of good things, which I'm remembering all the time and drawing on when I'm giving classes. But it was his doing by saying, I think you'd learn more from him. And he wasn't my absolute first choice, but my God, he was, it was a wonderful bit of direction shooting. Oh, good. Well, they were very great friends, Jean-Pierre and yeah. and Daddy. So that, would have, that was nice anyway, that, um, that you did study with, with Ram Hal for at least yeah. a portion of the time. Now, but I was also a, a great admirer of the wonderful French flute player Dufresne. Fernand ah. Dufresne, who was another of your father's favourites. Yes, he was. I can't remember his first name. Fernand. Oh, I don't. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, yes, uh, they were very good friends. Very good friends. That's what I thought. You know, yeah. I, w I wanted to copy Moise or Dufresne, or both. Now, when did you find yourself in the LSO? Because I think you came to Daytona at one point, did you oh, not? Oh, yes. A little later. I. I got into my first orchestra when I was about 22, 23 in Manchester, and I did a couple of years there. And then I came back and did a year in Sadler's Wells Opera, and then I left to freelance. And then, very little time after that, I was 29 when I went to study with Marcel Moyes for the first time. And it was very shortly after that that I got into the LSO, so I was 30. And were they coming to do the International Festival or...? Oh did... yes, they, were, they came to Florida. They would, had the thing in Daytona Beach. And Daddy was there, presumably, as well. Yes, he'd just started in Stetson. Oh, OK, he just started at Stetson. Yeah. Oh, right. Did he play in the LSO with you? Because he did a bit of guest flute playing. He came um, and played in the section, which was a bit unnerving. Oh, one. <laughs> did he really? We did Heldenleben. He was fourth flute. Oh my goodness! That, that was unnerving for me, having right. the world's greatest flute right. player sitting down the line from me. Right. <laughs> Is it Heldenleben? No, it's Daphnis and Chloe. Where there's that big run down, um, which ends in the in the bass flute or something. And Daddy had a sort of some method of with a rubber band of making it work. I don't know. I don't you, know. You I, don't know. It, was some, it was something anyway. Something was pretty Right, but Heldenleben, that's some, my goodness. And <laughs> that's so funny, I didn't know that. Um, but there was his work with the LSO that led to him coming to um, Deland and coming yes, well, to he, Stetson. Yes, he'd done it before. Right. The exceptional teaching methods of my father, flutist Geoffrey Gilbert, are known the world over. For more information about his extraordinary professional life and career, tune in to the Telly Award winning and regional Emmy nominated documentary, Geoffrey Gilbert, Gentleman of the Flute. Available now on DVD and Amazon Instant Video, US, UK, Germany and Japan. Simply visit Amazon and search for Geoffrey Gilbert Flute to find our program. And then you came back with the English Chamber Orchestra because I oh, presented you. many years later. Yes, yeah. well, I presented you. You've forgotten that. Um, yeah. But I, that news journal, the news journal um, was the um, host and mm. sponsor. And I was working for the news journal, so I got to present you oh. um, with the ECO. And that was a very happy, they were very nice. Pauline oh, yeah. Gilbertson, you remember Pauline Gilbertson? Yes. Yeah, she's just a sweet, absolutely yeah. sweet woman. So I remember that with tremendous affection because we had such a nice time. I can't remember what you played. I think you played a concerto when you were here. Um, well, I played Mozart D major somewhere in the land. Okay, well, that's, that's probably what it was. Yeah. Um, you've been really around this area for some considerable, you know, on, on various visits. So tell us now, what are you doing now? What am I doing now? Well, uh, I'm still teaching a bit. 
Right, and where, where, where are you teaching? I teach at the Royal Academy in London and I do quite a lot of master classes. It tends to take me here, there and everywhere. <laughs> yes, I've flown to a great number of places doing that sort of thing. You know, Far East and Middle East and you name it. And Japan, presumably. Oh, Japan, yes. My wife being Japanese. Of now. course. Um, so you don't play in an orchestra anymore? Well, no, I'm much. a bit old for playing in orchestras. It's not much fun, I presume, when you've already done it all anyway. Well, orchestras are very exciting when they're good, but they're very frustrating when they're not good. And when you're going on these long tours, quite often they're not so exciting. I've been on tours with the Academy of St. Martins, which you know about, with Neville Mariner. He was good. But there have been numerous tours once done with a very crumbly sort of orchestra. <laughs> and tours with them were not so exciting. I want you to talk about, um, for a minute or two, the upcoming new young flute players that are following in your your footsteps, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, because I am now out of the link. But tell me who you think the big upcoming stars of the flute are going to be. Well, for me, the best are Lorna McGee and Denis Buryakov, my, both my pupils. Oh, they're both your pupils? I didn't realize they were you both. You don't your... know Denis? Well, I know his name. Um, and I know I can't say oh, it. Oh yes, he came, to, <laughs> he came to London when he was 16 or something. Really? After a master class and we got, you know, fixed him up and he studied, did all his study with, with me and then sailed into various jobs and never looked back. <laughs> well, he's got a terrific reputation. I'll have to look at him on, I'm sure he's on YouTube or he's on one of, I can find him somewhere on the, on the web. I think the he's internet. the player with the most stunning technique of anybody. Really? Yeah. Tell us um, a little bit in regard to Lorna. What qualities does she have that make her so special? Well, she has a fantastically good technique, but that goes without saying anything, really. She plays superbly in tune with lots of different colours and has a very fertile imagination, musical imagination. And I just think she's absolutely thrilling when I hear her, to hear all these colours and marvellous things coming out of the flute. She did something recently that you heard, Bach, didn't she? Oh, she, she played the Bach Chacon, which is probably almost impossible on the violin, but she played it in a concert this uh, about 10 days ago on the flute alone. Denis Buryakov's arrangement. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. And you said it was incredible. Yeah. You said it was marvellous. Uh, unplayable, but she just got up and sailed through Rattled it, it off. <laughs> what um, is your feeling about the young players coming, um, you know, even younger players who are studying now? How is the teaching of the flute developing? Have they followed in your footsteps and daddy's footsteps? Is it changing? What do you find as you go around to do these master classes, for example? Well, I find in England that the, the standard has gone up a tremendous amount. Uh, there's a whole lot of them can play the flute quite well in tune, for instance, which wasn't, hasn't always been the case with the flute at all. But, you know, nowadays people, they've got, gotten the habit of ex demanding or expecting the flute should sound reasonably <laughs> well in tune. And that's a fantastic jump forward. What about and the as always, there are all too few who can really make music come out of the thing. That's why I'm so thrilled with Lorna McGee and Denis Buryakov. And I've got a few others who are very distinguished too, but they're the ones that sort of stick out a mile. While we're on the subject of, of tuning, you are really quite famous for having dealt with this problem of the flute being out, out of, of tune. tune. Tell us a little bit about that, because the Bennett scale 
has become quite important. And <laughs> how did you arrive at dealing with that? I, when I was 18, I joined the army and flutes were very out of tune then. Only the very great ones, like your father and a few, and Dufresne, could play the flute really well in tune. And it was a inferior instrument. The instruments we, we, most of us were using were built originally to be played at a flatter pitch than was now the concert pitch. A440, A440. And I, at the time when I was in the army, was playing on a terrible flute, which I thought was frightful. The C hole, the thumb hole on my flute was terribly flat, most unlike in, almost anything else. And this was a sharp pitch Louis Lot flute, French flute, rebuilt by Mr. Morley. Oh, I remember uh, Mr. Morley. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> Had a and very high voice, he, didn't he? Didn't he have oh, a very yes. high voice? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I had this flute and it wasn't in tune at all. I was suffering with this and it didn't work very well. <laughs> Pads were a problem. And I came to America with the band. I was in the Scots Guard. We did a, one of the first tours to, to the United States. We ended up now, we started off staying with the Marine Band in Washington. And one of the boys in the band sold me a head joint by flute maker Powell, which was like Stradivarius in those days. So I, fantastic, it cost me $30, which is more than a week's ration money. And I borrowed some from my friends in the band and bought this head joint and had stuffed it in my pocket and went off. And I wanted to have a flute like the Powell flute. And I couldn't afford it. It was an astronomical sum of money. While I was still in the States, I knew that I would have to make my own flute. So I got the measurements of a Powell flute. When we went back through Washington on the way home, I borrowed my friend's flute power flute and stuck strips of paper under the keys and pressed down with carbon copying paper as bet between the pad and the, and the paper and got impressions of where the holes were placed. And I had this power head joint and I now had so a rough sort of measurement of where the holes were and I went home to my father's drawing board and drew out a plan of where I thought the power scale was. And it took eight or nine months before I, I got a flute to work. I had to get a tube from the silver company, which is Johnson and Matthew of Covent Garden. I bought an old sharp pitch flute to get the keys off it and started trying to learn to solder to put the whole thing together again. It took about nine months before I could get it to work at all. I was playing it. Oh yes, but the C is very sharp. So I thought, well, look, that's because I had to wrap the piece of paper that went under all the keys. They had to wrap around to get the measurement of where the C was. I wasn't sure that that was in the right place. But when I'd made it, I knew it was in the wrong place. So I put something, some muck, plastic metal that I got out of a tube in the top end of the hole and it got much better. Then I took it to Geoffrey, who feigned the amazement that it worked at all. And he played it for a few minutes and said, hmm, don't you think the E flat's a bit flat? And I took it and tried, oh my God, how awful. How could I let that happen? So I went straight home and cut about three millimeters off the foot joint so it would go up a bit further. And then a few months later, I met an American amateur flute player who had lessons with Georges Laurent and had some Powell flutes and he came to London and then I tried my flute in comparison with these wonderful perfect Powells but I had to say that my flute was slightly less out of tune than the Powell. <laughs> it, it, the rot had started. I found that we could change, change things on the flute. That's why when I came to your, your room to play flute quartets 
yeah. with, um, I forget, Jane, her name was. Remember? Jane Davis, yes. yes. And um, all the saucepans were full of, of metal pieces, oh, all bits melting. Bits of flute, yes. Yes, <laughs> bits of flute. I didn't know how you were going to make the spaghetti for us, because every single saucepan seemed to be full of bits of flute. But you did make it somehow. You managed to to make our did supper. Did you manage for us. to spit out the bits of silver? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you thought they were my fillings. <laughs> Good. We we can't thank you enough for being here. We know you have a very busy schedule. It's been a pleasure to see you again after such a long time. I haven't seen you for many years anyway, but we have been friends for such a long time. It's just been such fun to be with you the last few days. And I am going to mention again the fact that this beautiful book, Edward Blakeman wrote it with your help. Yeah. Um, but it's a lovely book and it's got lots of, as we said before, it's got lots of your drawings and things in. But really, thank you very much indeed for being here and giving us the time. And I know you're flying off now to Orlando to do another masterclass. And then tomorrow you're flying off again to see Eldred Spell. Mm. Um, so that will be fun. Please send Eldred my love. Um, we haven't actually ever met, but send him my love anyway. You haven't. No, oh. I haven't met Eldred. You must meet the wizard. I will meet the wizard sometime. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being with us. The beautiful flute and piano music you've heard playing softly in the background of this broadcast is from William Bennett's recording of Melodies and Encores featuring some of Wibb's favourite pieces by Brahms, Chopin, Mendelssohn and others. Recorded live at the Wigmore Hall in London, produced by Michi Bennett, with recording engineer Peter Townsend, Wibb was accompanied by his favourite pianist, Clifford Benson. William Bennett's Melodies and Encores CD recording is available now online at windsorpress.com. Wibb a Flute for Life is a comprehensive biographical text about the life and legacy of the incredible William Bennett, featuring over 100 personal photos and hand-drawn sketches by Wibb himself. Wibb, A Flute for Life is available now on windsorpress.com. This very special webisode of Adventures in Music is brought to you by Windsor Press, publishers of the best biographical publications for the next generation of flutists and educators. Musician biographies, educational texts, sheet music and CDs are now shipping worldwide. Shop online at windsorpress.com where you can learn from the masters.